Hello everyone, The Thin Veil here. Today we're going to be reading a few stories I found online on the Creepypasta wiki. If you like this type of content, make sure you like and subscribe. Now, let's get straight into them. Lynn and I met in 2008. She was from a very small town in Washington with a population of less than 500. I was working my way through college as an event bartender in Portland. Lynn's cousin was getting married in Portland and as fate would have it, the wedding reception was held at an upscale hotel on the Columbia River where I frequently tended to small wine and beer bars. I noticed her immediately, as I often notice women that I quickly convince myself are too beautiful to ever date someone like me. Eventually, as the night went on, she made her way over to my bar in order to white wine. We talked for a while about Portland. I sweated profusely as I tend to do around girls like her. She would be spending the next two days in the city, and I took a few moments telling her about the most interesting sights to see and things to do in town. Wow, you should be my personal tour guide, she said grabbing my arm and smiling. This happened to me so infrequently that I really had no idea how to react. So I just mumbled out, Sure, what, what time? And laughed nervously to hedge in the event she was joking. How about 10.30 tomorrow morning? She replied, and so started my relationship with Lynn. She was infectious, with a personality that was so innocent and warm. I immediately fell in love with her. There were a few issues that we would have to work, though. She was still in Washington, and I was finishing school in Oregon. Lynn was Vietnamese with a very traditional father who would never approve of her having a white boyfriend. She lived alone in a house with her father, as her mother had passed away several years earlier. So going to Yarrow Point to visit her was out of the question. She would come to see me every three weeks under the guise of a prestigious internship program. Being in a relationship, we spoke on the phone and texted constantly. When high-speed internet finally came to her small town in Washington, I surprised her with a webcam for her computer so we could have an even better means of long-distance communication. In the back of my mind, I was always looking for ways to be with her, as even after two years of dating, I was paranoid a girl as beautiful as her would eventually find someone better to share her life with. In 2010, Lynn's father passed away suddenly in his sleep from a heart attack. He was everything to her and she was heartbroken. When she returned from Florida, where the funeral was held and her father buried, she was all alone in the house where she had lost both of her parents. With Lynn's father deceased, she was open to finally allowing me to come to Washington to see her, which we planned on doing in a few weeks after my college finals anyways. One night during our usual bedtime conversation, Lynn mentioned to me that her father had been acting Strangely, in the days leading up to his death, she explained that he had taken to checking up on her multiple times throughout the day and night, and scattering religious artifacts throughout the house. This behavior, she said, was highly uncharacteristic of him. Vietnamese culture and religion was something foreign to me, and at various points, Lin had mentioned things like this that I normally wrote off just as being a little silly. She explained to me that being in the house alone without her dad was emotional and maybe playing tricks on her. She hated the feeling of being so alone. She told me that being able to see me on her webcam was the closest thing she had to family and asked that I promise to never turn off the webcam. She meant the world to me, so I was happy to oblige. A few days passed and it was now the Tuesday before the weekend when I would finally be able to come see her in Washington. We spent our bedtime webcam session excitedly talking about our plans and I dozed off with my head on the kitchen table in mid-conversation. It had been a long day. When I woke up, I saw Lynn sleeping on my screen and stumbled off to bed. At 3am, my cell phone began to ring. Disoriented, I rolled over, took a look at the clock and knew it could only be her. She took great pleasure in waking me up in the middle of the night to let me know that she had just gotten a drink of water or had an amusing dream. Anyone else would have gotten an earful from me, but 
Her flirtatious giggle made me feel lucky to have my much-needed sleep interrupted. I had a nightmare, Lynn gasped. You danced in front of my friends. She burst into laughter. What are you doing up so late, honey? You've got work in the morning, I said. I was thirsty. I went downstairs to get a drink of water. Great. Well, we really should go back to sleep. Tomorrow is a big day. All right, she conceded. Hey, by the way, don't forget... After a few crackles and a brief burst of static, the call disconnected. I hated Lynn's phone. She had an old flip phone that dropped calls with no rhymes or reason at least three times a day. I held down the number one on my phone, my speed dialed for Lynn, no ring, straight to voicemail. I tried to call several more times, and each time it again went straight to voicemail. I was exhausted, and though I loved Lynn to death, to be honest, I just wanted to go back to sleep. My eyelids hung heavy. A little annoyed, I decided to walk out to my kitchen for a quick drink of water. The two glasses of wine that I drank before bed had left me with a little bit of a dry mouth. As I rinsed the glass and went to place it in the dishwasher, out of the corner of my eye, I saw movement on the glow of the laptop perched on my dining room table. It was the webcam. Two fluffy brown paws were making a swimming motion directly in front of her camera. As I got closer, I saw a close-up of two grinning faces, one of that silly dog of hers and the other of my giggling girlfriend, who knew that eventually after being unable to make phone contact, I would wander out to the webcam to say goodnight. I wouldn't put it past her to turn the phone off on purpose to elaborately stage this scene. Me, standing in my underwear at 3am on a work night, half asleep staring at a girl and a puppy on a webcam. I waved goodnight, and she kissed the lens of the webcam and pulled away. I froze. I wiped my eyes and looked again. There. It's standing in the corner of the room. It's staring at her, wrinkled, angry, twisted mouth, hateful eyes. What the fuck? Hateful eyes. It's watching her. Two hours later, I woke up on the dining room floor. I had a ringing in my ears and a knot on the back of my head. I immediately knew what had happened. It wasn't the first time. Sudden, extreme stress has given me panic attacks and blackouts a few times before. I had never felt such fear when what happened came rushing back, and I nearly had a second panic attack when my thoughts turned to Lynn. I loved her more than anything in the world. It took me several moments to summon the courage to look in the direction of my laptop. When I finally did, the screensaver had long since turned on. I looked away from the screen as I flicked the touchpad with my shaking finger. It took me another two minutes to open my eyes. Lynn lay sleeping in her bed. She looked so peaceful, sleeping on her sofa, facing towards a webcam. As frightened and confused as I was, relief at her safety gave me a sense of comfort as I desperately tried to process what had happened. Maybe the wine had hit me harder than I thought. Maybe I slipped and fell on the slick tile floor, and it had all been a nightmare. I stared at her. I loved her. Maybe more than I even realized so peaceful and beautiful as she slept. The light of her television danced across the room and illuminated the bed. As I watched on, her hand began to move. Slowly. Unnaturally. She was sleeping, but her fingers crawled across the bed slowly until they reached something. It was her cell phone. Her hand moved like a spider. Fingers popping in several directions across the keys. What? What the hell? My phone was vibrating. It was Lynn. The message read, Don't turn off the webcam. And another message. 
Don't turn off the webcam. As I glanced back to my laptop, fear gripped me. As slowly, a shadow crept across the floor. Something was crossing in front of the television, moving closer to Lynn. I told myself, it was just her dog, right? The color drained out of my face when I noticed the puppy was sleeping in the far corner of the room. I picked up my phone and dialed Lynn. I didn't know what I would tell her, but I knew she needed to get out of there immediately and never go back. Damn it, straight to voicemail, that stupid old phone of hers. The full shadow now hung completely over Lynn. Her hand jerked, flipping open her cell phone. My phone was ringing. I answered. Lynn, Lynn, can you hear me? You, you need to... A burst of loud static forced my phone reflexively away from my ear. On the webcam, I saw Lynn's lips begin to move. Her eyes were shut, but she was speaking. I heard her voice come across the phone, but something wasn't right. She was speaking, but a second, deeper voice echoed hers in perfect unison. Who? What? What does he want? I yelled in desperation. He wants to eat your skin. The line disconnected. The shadow across Lynn's bed changed directions. It started moving away from the bed and towards her laptop, towards the webcam. As the shadow moved closer, small streams of grey liquid rolled towards the lens. The images coming across my monitor began to shake violently. It was almost here. I could now see the top of its head. It was crawling towards me. Wet strings of silver and black hair hanging over its face. I remembered those hateful eyes. And I lost control of my bladder as it slowly tilted its head. And then I did it. In panic, I slammed my laptop shut and threw it against the hard tile floor before collapsing to the ground. I wished for a panic attack to take my consciousness and end this nightmare, but it didn't come. I crawled to the panel of switches a few feet up on the wall and turned on every light that I could. I noticed a bottle of wine still open on the kitchen counter and drank most of it down in a single swallow. I reached up and pulled open my apartment door and stumbled across the threshold, extending half of my body into the common hallway so I wouldn't feel so alone. A pathetic coward sprawled out on the concrete. My phone began to ring. I crawled to it. Lynn's name was flashing on the caller ID. I held it in my hand, paralyzed in fear. And then the ringing stopped. I took another mouthful of wine and mustered the courage to call back. It went straight to voicemail. And then again and again as I tried to call. Eventually the shock and drowsiness from the wine got the better of me and I passed out on the floor after making a few more attempts. When I awoke several hours later, despite the broken laptop and empty bottle, I wanted to believe it was all some sort of horrible nightmare. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a blue flashing light on my cell phone. It was a new voicemail. My hand trembled as I dialed my voicemail and entered my passcode. The message was timestamped and was from the missed call I had from Lynn before passing out. Her voice. She was in tears and frightened as though I had never heard her before. You promised. Why? Why did you turn off the webcam? His, his tongue burns. With a crackle, the message ended. Two years have passed since that night. I never tried to contact Lynn again. I never called her work to see if she came in the following morning. I never made it to Yarrow Point in Washington where she lived. She was my soulmate and I let this happen. I was probably right on the night we met when I told myself I wasn't man enough for her. The only reason I am telling this story today, under the cowardly veil of anonymity, is because my drug and alcohol counselor thinks it would be good for me. 
so here it is. I made the decision to let the love of my life face an unimaginable nightmare to spare myself. And the worst part is that I may not even regret it. Now, if you'll excuse me, I think I need another drink. I used to be an avid watcher of YouTube. I had subscribed to literally hundreds of channels and watched probably thousands of videos. I especially loved channels that featured spooky content, short films, disturbing facts, lists, scary story readings, you name it. I was hooked on that stuff. A real horror junkie. There was nothing I liked better than ending a long day of school or work curled up in front of my monitor headphones cupped around my ears, watching an amateur creepypasta flick or learning about creepy video game glitches. One day while browsing through the site, I happened to click on a certain video in my recommendations. Nothing particularly special about it. I was just kind of going down the line. And that one was up next. I could have easily skipped over it or watched it first. Anyway, the video was made by a YouTuber called Looney Lorraine 713 In the video, Lorraine, a youngish woman with frizzy brown hair that hid more than half her face, did a basic outdoor vlog pertaining to some urban legend. She spoke with locals, trekked through daytime woods, and scouted out a small playground at night, all the while sporting a very playful, entertaining attitude, very unlike the average horror host. Her editing wasn't bad either, making the vlog seem more like a story than just a person talking to a camera. At the end, she had this cute outro where she made a sideways peace sign over her left eye and said, Stay spooky. I knew I liked her immediately. I quickly subbed to Lorraine's channel and started watching all of her videos. She mostly did solo mystery hunting stuff, but there were a few skits in there. A couple Edgar Allan Poe readings, update vlogs, etc. Each one ended with either her or a drawing of her making the peace sign over her eye and saying, Stay spooky. I became a big fan of her work, never failing to post a comment on a video or click the like and favorite button. I even had my phone send me text alerts when she uploaded a new video. I was that hooked. Nearly six months of avid watching passed. And I started to think of Lorraine as a friend. Now, don't get the wrong idea. This isn't a story about how I became a stalker. I just mean that Lorraine and her content became a big part of my daily routine. Something fun and exciting to look forward to when I got home. Bad day at work? I'd watch Lorraine carve a really bad Freddy Krueger pumpkin. Finish two hours of schoolwork? I'd listen to Lorraine read The Raven for the umpteenth time. Her videos were something that made me happy, and at the time, I couldn't thank her enough for that. Sure, I wondered what it would be like to meet Lorraine, to actually talk to her and tell her how awesome she was, but I doubted that would ever happen. She never said where she lived in her videos, and she didn't go to conventions or public events for signings or meetups. She didn't even like to show her face on camera, one side of it was always covered by her perpetually messy brown hair. I accepted this, though. I was content with just being a fan. As long as she kept making neat videos, I was perfectly happy. Then, things started to get strange. At some point in Lorraine's vlogs, I began to notice something in the background. What looked like a pair of orbs. Flat, glowing a dull red. It was indistinct at first, hardly catching my attention at all. But, with each video, the orbs seemed to become clearer, to move closer and closer to Lorraine. By one video, they were right beside her head, though she didn't seem to notice. I wasn't the only one to see this. 
The comment section was often filled with others asking what the heck those things were. Lorraine replied to a few of those comments saying that it was probably something wrong with her camera or a trick of the light. This made me suspicious. This girl thrived on conspiracies, urban legends, and the paranormal. The reaction I'd expected out of her was that they were the presence of some ghost or alien laser pointers or some other ridiculous pseudo-paranoid idea. Why would she be so quick to disregard something that, for all intents and purposes, seemed even more real than any ghost she'd hunted or Bigfoot she'd chased? And something else about the videos bothered me. As time passed, Lorraine's content changed. She didn't do as many legend hunting tricks as she used to. Her readings seemed flatter and less involved. Even her vlogs, which pretty much became her primary content, seemed so different from just a couple of months before. For example, one of the later videos consisted of her sitting in her office chair before the black sheet she had draped behind her for all her at-home vlogs, just staring off to the side her hair-veiled face looking incredibly blank and sad. The orbs were also in the video, hovering just behind her head like red eyes peering down at her. When a full two minutes of silence had elapsed, she glanced up at the camera, made the peace sign over her eye, and said in a perfect monotone, completely unlike her, Stay spooky. I grew very concerned, as did the rest of the small fanbase she had. People constantly asked in the comments if she was alright, if something was wrong, or if she was playing some joke on us. Lorraine never replied, never gave any indication as to what was happening. Even the descriptions of her videos were left blank. Her uploads grew fewer and far between until, after probably three months of strange behavior, they stopped completely. No vlogs, no skits, no updates. More questions from viewers, myself included. Are you dead? What happened to your daily videos? Is everything okay? Not a single response. Then, one day, completely out of nowhere, all the videos on her channel disappeared. Each and every one of them deleted. You could search the entire spectrum of the internet and not find a single trace of them. The channel became an empty shell, with even the profile page and photo slot wiped clean. I was caught between disappointment and concern. Lorraine and her videos were my escape, my home away from home, and to have them just vanish the way they did broke my heart. I constantly wondered what happened to her, what made her change and drop off the face of the earth like that. More than anything, I wondered if she was alright. Those weird orbs in the background of her videos kept coming back to me, filling me with unease. Something to do with them. But what? I had a dozen horror-inspired explanations for that, but I didn't really believe any of them. Whatever happened with Lorraine was real, not some nightmare written on Reddit no sleep. So what could it have been then? I got my answer when, after an entire month of inactivity, Lorraine finally posted a video. I was shocked when my phone informed me of the new vlog. I think I even said something out loud like, She's alive! Quickly, I found a quiet spot to sit, plugged in my headphones, and opened YouTube. The video was first up on my subscriptions list, entitled simply, I'm sorry. I felt a wave of relief wash over me. So she was alright after all coming back and apologizing for whatever happened with the old stuff. She didn't have to be sorry. I was just glad she was back. Smiling, I opened the video. It was nothing like her normal vlogs, where she pops on screen with her arms spread wide and her white grin partially covered by her hair. It cuts straight to a very, very close shot of Lorraine's face, the lens practically pressed against her chin. Her camera phone the only source of light. Her breathing was very loud, obviously too close to the mic. It made me jump a little. She then pulled the camera away so that I could see her whole face and not much else. It was completely dark around her, though I thought I could make out bathtub tiles behind her when the light moved. Her face was half hidden as always, but her expression was jarring. She looked terrified. 
her brown eyes wide, her jaw trembling, her skin white as cheese. When she spoke, it was in a whisper so quiet that I had to turn my volume way up to hear it. Hey, hey guys, L -L Loni Lorraine here. Uh, you're probably wondering why I haven't posted in a while, or why all my videos were deleted. Well, things have gotten a little strange. She paused to glance around herself, her camera dipping down to let me see her chest moving furiously up and down with her frantic breathing. A moment later, she readjusted the camera and resumed speaking. There's not a whole lot that I can explain. I don't have much time, but all you really need to know is that I, I, I fucked up. Yeah, I fucked up big time. I blinked when she said this. If there was one thing I knew about Lorraine is that she never, ever swore. Not even when she got scared during a ghost hunt or a haunted house run. This added to the feeling that something wasn't right. I listened on as she nervously whispered to the camera. Uh, I don't know when it happened or what I did exactly, but I... God, this is going to sound crazy, but I need to tell you. Do you guys remember my old cheating death videos? The ones where I play supposedly haunted games and creepy rituals. Well, I think that during one of them, I don't know which, I think I unleashed something very, very bad. Again, she paused to look around as if trying to spot something watching her in the close darkness. She swallowed and wiped her brow with her sleeve before continuing. it until it was too late. I just started getting really tired for a while, like I had no energy, no drive. I thought I was just getting sick or something, but then it got worse and worse, week by week. Then the nightmares got those horrible. I fought sleep for weeks on end to avoid seeing those awful images. Can't even begin to describe them. I don't want to. I I can't. A tear rolled down her cheek and she wiped it away, sniffing hard. I was locked on the video, her pain seeming so real, her terror so genuine. Where was she? What was happening to her? By the time I realized what was going on, I'd stopped making videos. I barely left my house, spoke with my family. I had blank spells, I lost time, I started seeing my nightmares when I wasn't asleep, in broad daylight, I thought I was losing my mind. She paused to take a breath, the exhale coming out in a long shudder. Guys, do you remember those orbs? Those weird red things that kept appearing in my videos? I felt a cold chill pass through me. I think I knew what she was going to say before she said it. I lied to you. N not at first, but towards the end, when I said I didn't know what they were. They're not lens flares or specks of dust or whatever. They're actually eyes. I know this because I've seen the same eyes in my nightmares, attached to the face of something too terrible for me to describe. When I finally realized this, that whatever was haunting me was actually real, I got scared. I took everything off my channel, deleted everything that had to do with me thinking it might help, but I think I only made it angry. So I packed a couple of bags and left town. I've been running around for at least a month now. She closed her eyes and pursed her lips for a moment looking almost childlike in terror. The nightmares are non-stop now. I haven't slept in a couple of days, but the eyes and the images. Guys, I don't know how long I have. I'm at a motel now, hiding in the bathroom. It's in the room. It's stronger now. I'm gonna wait it out until morning and 
try to head out again. Find another place to... to spend the night. But... I just wanted to make one last video before I did... in case... well... in case... She looked at the camera, her eyes bloodshot, her lips trembling with a soft smile. I, um, just wanted to say, I'm sorry for letting you guys down. You supported me in all my weird adventures and stupid shenanigans, and I repay you like this by making the biggest mistake of my life. I just hope you guys can forgive me for what I did and what's going to happen. I hope you'll remember me for who I was. I hope that I made some of you out there a little happier for a while. I had to cover my mouth to keep down the choked sob that wanted to get out. She sounded so scared. I wanted to do something. I wanted to help her, save her. But I didn't know where she was or what was really happening. Demon, maniac, whatever, she was in trouble. But there was nothing I or anyone else could do. Especially when, from the dimly lit darkness, four little arms as black as ink started to reach out from behind Lorraine. They weren't special effects. They weren't props on strings, they were real. Extending out from the shapes of small figures pressed against the tile, figures with red, orb-like eyes. I started screaming at my phone, calling off for Lorraine, telling her to look out, to get out of there. Of course she didn't hear me. This was a pre-recorded video. The young woman with her face half veiled with hair only sniffed made a peace sign over her left eye and whispered, stay spooky, as the hands wrapped around her face. The sound of her scream amplified by the volume increase made me tear my headphones out and drop the phone. On the little screen, I saw her do the same. The view bouncing and blurring for a moment before the camera came to a stop propped slightly against the wall. In the faint phone light, I could see the edge of a white bathtub and Lorraine's thrashing legs being pulled up into it. I could still hear muffled sounds coming from the dislodged headphones, screaming, banging and something else that made my skin absolutely crawl. Before long, something red began to drip down over the side of the tub and pool on the linoleum. Seconds after that, the screaming stopped, and all I could hear was that awful, grotesque tearing, then the screen cut out, and the video ended. It's been about a month since all that happened. They found her body about a week after I'm Sorry was posted. One Lorraine McDermott, aged 25, resident of some small town in southern Wisconsin. She'd been staying at a motel about 15 miles north of Chicago. A maid had stumbled upon her in the bathroom of one of the rooms and was quoted as saying, I'd never seen so much blood in my life. Her family was contacted immediately after the remains were identified. No clues as to what had killed her were ever found. I never met Lorraine, I never spoke to her or contacted her in any way. But seeing that video, learning of her death, I felt like I had lost a good friend. She may not have known it, but she was important to me important to a lot of people. She was a good person. She didn't deserve to die like that. She didn't deserve the torment that led up to it. I made a page on Facebook in dedication to her. Some of her old subscribers liked that page, but there isn't much I can do with it. About 15 minutes after that last video was posted, Lorraine's channel had been deleted for good. So, if you were thinking of finding it or that video after reading this, you're out of luck. You can't even find screen caps of her content. To this day, I don't know who did it or why. People I've talked with online said that only a couple of dozen people actually saw the video, and that there's no copy of there anywhere on the internet. Someone had even tried to call the police after seeing it. But no one could find the link afterwards. There was no way to explain what had really happened without sounding like some lying horror junkie. Hence the reason the case went cold. There is really not much more I or any of the others can do besides keep her memory alive on her page. Maybe it's better that way. Having her videos gone, especially that last one, I think about it often. If they hadn't actually found her, I'm sure most people who saw it would have said it was faked. Even a diehard believer of the paranormal might have played the skeptic card. 
I remember the fear in Lorraine's eyes, the tremors in her voice. That's probably what clinched it for me, and a lot of the others. You can't fake a level of fear like that. And those things behind her. I still can't say what they were. Without the old videos, I can't deduce which game or ritual she played caused them to... I guess, awaken is the only suitable word. Did they disappear after they got Lorraine? Are they still out there? What exactly did she mean when she said she was sorry for what's going to happen? I don't know. And frankly, I don't want to know. I've pretty much had it with the strange and unusual. I don't even go on YouTube much anymore. It reminds me too much of a dead friend. I think I might delete Lorraine's page. I think I need a break from all the creepiness for a while. After all, it's not helping that people keep talking about the eyes from our videos. They've been posting troll comments like how they've seen them in real life and how weird shadows appear in their pictures. Some have even talked about having nightmares. This is probably my fault because I wrote a few status updates about how I've been having really bad dreams lately. A little accidental suggestion on my part, I suppose. Still, it's disrespectful to her memory to keep this kind of talk going. So yeah, I'll delete it later today. I think Lorraine would understand. She wouldn't want anyone to end up like her. Anyway, I've said all I wanted to, and I'm really tired. I think I'll try and sleep. Hopefully there won't be any of those nightmares this time. I don't think I can take another night without closing my eyes. I might go insane. Several years back, I caught a pretty bad case of the flu after walking home from high school in the pouring rain. Although I had company on the way, a shy boy I hardly knew the name of from the year below me, who had offered me shelter under his Spongebob umbrella in return for my number, it was a walk I sincerely regretted. The flu caused me to have to stay at home for several weeks. Although the first few days were living hell for me, lying in bed without any sort of social contact worth mentioning, this was before social media had reached my social circles. In addition, my phone had become so damaged by the rain that it could only sputter out a few gurgling metallic noises instead of my friends' voices. After a week or so, I was certainly in shape to stay awake for many hours at a time, and I was in desperate need to somehow satisfy my extrovert self. It was at this point I first stumbled upon the chat room. An ad directed me to the website, which claimed to offer locally based anonymous chat for everyone. After talking to many strangers on the site in private chats, who all indeed lived in my state, I realized everyone on there was incredibly unsafe with regards to handing out their private information. Of course, I would always fake an identity. A blonde girl, two years older than me, with a very attractive body, became the new me in all chats. I even invented a background history for her in case someone would be curious. The first few chats were mostly pleasant. I got to satisfy my social needs by chatting for hours with the same strangers, who were mostly girls or boys my own age. Naturally, I did not hand out any information to them. But they were all gladly giving out their full names, phone numbers, addresses, and even their pets' names. I was deeply worried at this point that my social life would break apart and forever be lost. I was in high school and my friends were the only ones who would be keeping me sane through the intense final exams. After the flu had finally passed, I demanded that my parents would provide me with a new phone in order to compensate for all the time I had lost with my friends. Although initially hesitant, they finally buckled under my demands and gave me a relatively modern phone, complete with a new number and everything. My social life managed to rebuild itself in a much shorter time than I had expected. I managed to catch up on all the latest gossip using my new gadget. Everyone in school was eager to talk to me and make sure I was okay. Even the boy who had walked me home tried to talk to me several times and charm me up, but with him being a year younger, it was obviously impossible for me to engage with him for any longer period of time. I decided to ignore him completely instead. More than two weeks had passed before I returned to the chat room again, after suddenly finding myself bored and alone after a long day at school. The first thing which was striking to me was that all the new strangers I connected to would almost invariably claim to be older men, asking whether or not I was interested in hooking up with someone experienced like themselves. 
Obviously, I disconnected them almost immediately, but I felt bad for what I thought might have been hundreds of innocent girls my age that may fall victim to these predators. Remembering everyone was fervent in handing out their private information, I decided to do the only right thing. The first older man I stayed to talk with was incredibly excited at my proposal to meet up. Teasing him with vague statements of my clothing drove him frothing to the point of him giving up important information like his age, first and last name, and street address. Using what he gave me, a quick search on the internet allowed me to know him better than himself. At this point, I knew his name, age, address, birthday, location, car number, wife's number, email address, and of course telephone numbers to him and every single worker at his workplace, where he was even the head of some committee. The sheer panic I knew he must have experienced when I told him all this and threatened to rat him out as an online predator willing to sleep with an underage girl gave me a sense of power I had never experienced before. He begged me to not release the information, but I simply saved the log and disconnected, writing all the information in a log. I realized how I potentially could have saved a girl from more or less being stalked, or even worse. Fifteen more names were added to the list within the next week. For every name added, I needed less and less information to make out who the person on the other side was. I became addicted, which was only fueled by my sense of fervor, as I noticed fewer and fewer of the predators claiming to be old. Their new tactic was to claim to be a boy with a similar age to me. Most of them were harder to track down. They usually would have to reveal things like their month of birth, first name, and general area of inhabitants before I had all I needed. All the information I gave to them was obviously all fake. One day, my parents told me they were going to be slightly late for dinner. Being stuck in traffic, I decided to spend the evening browsing the chat rooms, having a hard time finding any predators at all to discover. However, one person stuck out. It was someone claiming to be a 17-year-old boy who asked for my phone number the first thing he did. I was taken aback, as most predators would simply ask for a name gender, age, or general area first. I sat silent for almost half a minute before considering this a great opportunity. Countering their request, I asked them for their number and that I would call them. While my chat partner was typing their reply, I dug in my drawers from my old, almost broken phone. As the chat box containing their number appeared, I considered whether it would be safe to call. Obviously, my number had been deleted from the white pages and similar indexes. So with my confidence bolstered and intrigued by this mysterious chat partner, I dialed their number and pressed call. After almost a minute of no response, the other person picked up. The white noise from their broken phone was not enough to cover an adolescent voice asking whether or not I was home alone. Feeling virtually untraceable, I said that my parents were away for the evening. Immediately after I had finished my sentence, a small snicker could be heard through the noise. Better than that by now. I was shocked for a while, unable to speak. But what truly startled me and chilled my spine was what came next. The young voice slowly began listing my private information. Age, address, parents' names, my full name, my birthday, and even the names and numbers of my best friends. Suddenly, I felt the utter panic that I knew all the predators I had called out must have felt. The person on the other end hung up the call. My heart was racing for several seconds, and I shrieked as I heard a knock on the door. I rushed to the door, peeking out to see who had knocked. To my surprise, I saw a short figure, wearing a black sock over his head, standing akimbo just inches away from the peephole. My entire body froze when I saw him holding a gun. Not a fake, airsoft gun, but a real and deadly firearm in his right hand. I began to panic and search for a way to ensure the door's safety to no avail. I even ran to the kitchen, arming myself with a large butcher's knife, and hid in a closet in the living room. After hearing a few shots and the door opening, the last thing I remember seeing before fainting was a short figure slowly moving into the house. The police told me the following day how they had arrived on the scene after having received reports of gunfire from the house. They had found no trace of the assailant, but they hired a security guard to patrol our area each night to ensure his capture in case he would return. 
The only reason I am writing this story today is that my parents found a small and aged umbrella hidden in the closet, which they had never seen before in their lives. The umbrella's canopy was what truly caught my attention. It was decorated with several small, seemingly childish, Spongebob figurines. <laughs> 